Fantastic, Mr. Pat. So this work is done in uh, with my PhD student Shada Sita Raman. Uh, she's in the audience. Okay. Without this, uh, okay. Black and white. Okay, so here, uh, so I'll introduce to you. First of all, I'll explain to you these uh, big phrases in the title of my talk. So I'll tell you what is distribution of beneficial fitness effect. So many of you already know it, but anyway, I'll take you through that. And then I'll tell you about the specific model that I considered, namely the adaptive walk model. And the basic question that I'm asking is, what can we learn about this DBFE, which is a fundamental quantity? What can we learn about it from the dynamics of adaptation process? In particular, I'll focus on the adaptive walk model. So I'll tell you about theoretical results, which we have obtained, and relationship to experiments. Okay. So this is a physicist's cartoon of an animal cell which in which is infected by a bacteria and the bacterial genotypes are uh, denoted here by these black bars and this population is growing happily in the cell but let me now add antibiotic to the cell the population of this bacteria is now in a bad environment and many of them as you expect would die the population might completely perish then in that case okay there's nothing much to say but in some cases what can happen is the tough guys in the population might acquire one or more beneficial mutations and the population is now adapted. It starts to multiply again even in the presence of antibiotic. So a broad question that I'm interested in understanding is what are the dynamics of this adaptation process by which a maladapted population becomes adapted. Okay, So I'll, I'll try to answer this uh, question in some uh, specific setting. Okay. Uh, adaptation is frequently thought of as a hill climbing process. So here is a simple metaphor of a fitness landscape. So here is a sequence in quotes, and this is a fitness, and this is the climber, which is the population which is climbing up the peak. I would like to emphasize that this kind of pictures that you usually see in books, etc., is merely a metaphor. It's good to you know keep this picture in mind, but evolution actually happens in a very high dimensional space. So for illustration purposes, I have chosen binary sequences. And let me consider for an example, a binary sequence of length 3. If I have this binary sequence of length 3, there are eight possible sequences, which I can arrange on a queue. You saw similar figures in Lindy Wall's talk also. So OK, for this case, you can arrange them on a queue. So this cube is what we mean by this x-axis not just a two dimension, but a higher dimensional space. The fitness is represented here in these red numbers, which are simply just some numbers, which are obtained by some experiment or something. The climbing part is an adaptive trajectory, which happens when a sequence mutate by, let's say, a single change, such that the fitness increases. So here is an example of one such adaptive trajectory. Okay, So I'm thinking about such an adaptation dynamics in this high dimensional space. So, okay, so I want to now put the population on this high dimensional space and see what it does. But for that, I need to know characteristics of this fitness landscape. So, how do fitness landscapes look like? So, what I should do in principle is to take my favorite organism, generate all possible mutants, and measure all of the fitnesses of each of them. But clearly, that's an impossible task. For a sequence as small as 10, one has to generate a million genotypes and measure the fitness. So one doesn't really do that. But what is done is to measure the local fitness landscape. Okay? So experiments have been done to know how fitness landscape looks in certain parts of this high dimensional space. And there are sort of two methods that people use. One is a sort of direct method in which you decide that, okay, I'm going to focus only in this part of the genome for some reason. Okay? And then you generate more, all possible mutants of that and measure the fitness. Typically, 
such experiments have been done for uh, you know loci less than 10, 10 or less locus loci. Okay, that's a direct way of uh, getting some information about the topology of the fitness landscape. Then there is the indirect method in which you just let your population evolve, measure the study the adaptation dynamics, and then from that infer what might be the broad features of the fitness landscape. So this is direct method, indirect method, but we do know a little bit more about the fitness landscapes now. So here is a cartoon based on some experiments which suggest that fitness landscapes could be smooth with a single peak. They could have multiple peaks. They could have neutral parts. They could be detours, etc. This is not an exhaustive list, and remember, these are cartoons. Okay, so it's just to give you an idea about what sort of fitness landscapes, what, what kind of features do they have at the qualitative level. Today, I'm interested in understanding adaptation dynamics on rugged fitness landscapes. Again, you heard a little bit about this from Lindy Wall's talk. Let me explain what they are. So here again, if you like, think of Alps or Himalayas uh, to get a picture uh, of how rugged fitness landscapes look like. So these are the ones in which have a global peak, that is the highest peak. Then fitness landscapes, uh, rugged fitness landscapes have a lot of local peaks. So local peak is also a fitness peak, but it's not the highest one. Okay? So rugged fitness landscapes are characterized by a large number of local fitness peaks. Unless I take some limiting cases, the fitnesses are also correlated. They also are endowed with epistatic interactions. So it's a general class of fitness landscapes, and these are also supported by experiments. So I will not tell you. I can give you references later, but there are several experiments that suggest that fitness landscapes are indeed rugged. Now, I'm a theorist. I want to model fitness landscapes in my, on my computer. And how does one do that? We can generate rugged fitness landscapes. That is, so you remember I showed you this cube and I got these numbers. I can choose these numbers from a probability distribution and assign them to each of the sequences. And the resulting landscape would be rugged. But the question is, which distribution should I choose? It's an important enough question to ask the good fairy godmother of evolutionary genetics, who is not around. I mean, so what we, what we need to know the answer to this question, what is the frequency distribution of selective effects among new mutations? So when a mutation occurs, how many of them increase the fitness, how many decrease, and how many keep the fitness constant? You, saw, you saw, just saw an uh, example for DDFEs in uh, deeper stock also. And we want to know how large are these effects. Okay. So experiments have been done, and this is a typical uh, sort of Thing that people see in experiments. So here is an experiment on a virus, and then as Deepa mentioned already, what people do generally is not to take the entire genome and you know create all mutants, but just create one step mutant, let's say 50 or hundreds, a few hundreds of them, and measure their fitness and plot the histogram. So typically, the histogram looks something like this. So here are the fitnesses relative to the wild type. In this case, it happened to be about 20 percent. There are lots of lethal mutations. Then there are these deleterious ones because their fitness relative to the wild type is smaller than one. Then there is this tiny bit which is beneficial. It has a fitness higher than the wild type. So today, since I'm interested in adaptation, I want to focus on this last bar. Okay, and I want to know it's not just a number, there's a structure inside. So if I could sort of you know expand this bar, I want to know how does this distribution look like. And what can I learn about it from adaptation dynamics? But let me continue to this last bar. So that's my distribution of beneficial fitness effects, one half of the title of my talk. Now, interestingly, at least to me, that before what could experiments and measure this distribution, the insight from the for the nature of these distributions came from a theory. It's called the extreme value theory. It's a branch of it's a very well developed branch of statistics. So if I want to know what's the chance that the earthquake of Richter 9 will occur, it's, it happens, but it's a rare event. Such things are generally described by this extreme value theory. Now what we have here is a similar thing. Beneficial mutations are rare. So Gillespie realized, aha, uh -huh, I can apply extreme value theory to this case as well. So 
so I am not going to tell you all everything about it, but the main result that we need to know from this theory, which is uh, you know pertinent to this talk, is this. So suppose I do an experiment uh, and measure the distribution of fitness effect. So these are lethal mutations, here are deleterious ones, here is the wild type, and this is these are the beneficial mutations. This can be some complicated junk, but the extreme reality theory tells me that this tail has a very specific form. It is not some arbitrary infinite number of distributions. It, I mean, there are infinite number of distributions, but they can take only three types of shapes. Okay? What are these shapes? They could be bounded distributions. That means there is a cutoff, upper cutoff, and beyond this, there is no probability distribution. There is no weight beyond that. Think of uniform distribution. They could be exponential. I am plotting in semi-log. That is why you see a straight line. They could be fat tail distributions. Think of 1 by root x, 1 by x, 1 by x square. So those are the power laws or fat tail distributions. The main point is that these distribution of beneficial fitness effect could be bounded, exponential, or power law types. Okay? So biologically, what it means is that these two types, exponential and bounded, have uh, uh, these are examples of distributions of many uh, distributions for which there are many effects of small size. You see there are a lot of weight for the red curve and the green curve at small f. And the fat tail ones are the ones for which there are few effects of large size. Okay? And there has been a debate in literature. How does the evolution proceed? By the ones which confer small fitness effect or one with a large? Theory suggests that at least there should be that there should be all the three classes. But what do experiments tell us? Thankfully, experiments have been done and they tell us that in most cases, at least the experiments that have been done, in most cases they do see an exponential distribution. More recently, Holly Wickman's group and Reese Kassen group have found bounded distribution for DBFE. And one group, Aryan Duvisa, his group has found a fat tail distribution. So this goes roughly like 1 by f. Okay? So theoretical prediction is three classes, and indeed they have been seen in experiments. So this one is a little thing that I would like you to take home. In the last week, we saw people using distributions, and typically was exponential. I mean, in fact, exponential was the only distribution which is used. So here, I want to stress this point. There are other two classes also. And I think it's important that we, when we study adaptation dynamics, when we are thinking about distribution of fitness effects, we take the other two classes also into account and see how they change the adaptation dynamics. Okay. So these are measured, uh, you know, again directly in the sense that one measures the fitness of one step mutant and fit it to a certain formula. Don't worry about it. Only thing is that there is a parameter kappa in it, which is what people try to deduce. If it is negative, it is bounded. If it is positive, we have unbounded distribution. So basically, this is coming from the extreme value theory. Okay. So, so this is the story about DBFE, what we know by direct measurements of them. And as I said, there are three classes. So I want to know what can we learn about these distributions from the dynamics of adaptation? What kind of signatures do adaptation dynamics carry about this distribution? So that's the broad question that I'm interested in asking. Okay. So I'm going to focus on this adaptive walk model, which describes adaptation of finite haploid asexual populations. And they are evolving under certain conditions, which I'll explain. Strong selection, weak mutation condition. And the two questions that I'm asking are, what is the effect of fitness distribution? That means when I change this class of DBFEs, how does that show up in adaptation dynamics? And re remember, I also mentioned that regret fitness landscapes are correlated. How do correlations change the adaptation dynamics? How do they affect? So these are the two things that I want to know. Effect of fitness distribution and fitness correlations on adaptation dynamics. Okay. So this by now we all know what strong selection means. So as Brian and many others stressed, when we say strong selection, it doesn't mean s is large, s is a selection coefficient, but relative to something, relative to 1 by n. Okay. So this formula we also have seen several times now in this course, which is the probability of fixation. If selection is strong, then I can neglect deleterious and neutral mutations, and beneficial mutations will fix with the probability 1 minus e to the power minus 2s. 
if s is small, it, be, it becomes 2s, but s need not be small. Again, you heard about this, uh, about this from Lindy Wall's talk. It could be large also, so I'm going to keep this formula as it is. Uh, I'm not going to make, at least at this stage, the approximation uh, to 2s. Okay, so I'm going to keep this full Kimura's formula. This is the first assumption, strong selection regime. Other assumption is weak mutation regime. So let me explain that. So if mu is the probability of mutation at a single locus, at per locus per generation, the number of mutants produced per generation would be n times mu. So I'm assuming that n mu is much, much smaller than 1. So let me sort of explain this uh, by a simulation. So here I'm plotting population fraction as a function of time. So the red ones, red is the frequency of uh, sequence 0, 0, 0. So you know, frequency remains 1. It goes down because a better mutant, 0, 0, 1, which is at a distance 1 from it, came up. That takes over the entire population. That goes away. Then another one, again at a distance 1, comes up. And that again stays with the frequency 1 and so on. Okay, So from this uh, picture, you see the population is localized at a single sequence. It's monomorphic. And secondly, fitter mutants are single mutation away. So I'm not focusing on the, you, so you have seen this Muller diagram, right? In which at any time, there was only one type of population. You saw in the size talk. So I'm focusing basically on that regime in which at any point I have just single type of mutants. I'm ignoring interference completely, but I'll say a little bit about that at the end. Okay, so these are the two uh, uh, assumptions. And if I now put these two together, we arrive at the adaptive walk model of Gillespie. So let me explain this model. So again, we consider binary sequences let's say of length 4. So I'm going to consider any, in fact, very, very large L, but this is just for illustration purposes. Suppose uh, a length is 4, and fitness is uh, color-coded such that the lighter color corresponds to low fitness, and darker color corresponds to high fitness. So suppose population is sitting here with certain fitness. Because we are in weak mutation regime in which population is going to look at its nearest neighbors, this looks at its nearest neighbors. This one, this one, here and here. It decides to go to one of them. This one is, we can't go because it's a deleterious mutation which we are neglecting. So this, it doesn't go. Now it has three better ones and it decides to go to, let's say this one. How does it decide? It decides to go to, uh, let's say this guy according to the Kimura's transition probability. So say it went here, then it again looks in its neighborhood and it chooses to go here and then it came here. Now this one has a happens to be a local fitness peak. Local fitness peak, remember, is a peak. That means population sitting here, uh, uh, if the population sitting there, and if it makes a mutation, it will be a deleterious mutation by definition, right? So then we say the walk has stopped. So the walk of length three has taken or has it taken place? Of course, the population could have gone from here to here in single step. It could have also gone to another local peak as well. Okay, but I just wanted to elaborate this point a bit. So when you say that you know the walk has stopped, so wh what does that mean? So that's a little artificial in the model. So I just wanted to make this point clear. Suppose I don't impose any constraint that you know uh, uh, the population cannot proceed further or something, and here is a run from simulation. So what it means is this: at short time, the population fitness increases pretty quickly. Then when it hits a local maximum, it sits there for a very long time. Look at the scale. Okay? So it is not going to stay there forever. When it reaches a local fitness peak, it will come out of the valley. But that time is of the order 1 by n mu square. It needs at least two mutations. So basically, I'm saying, when I say the walk stops at local fitness peak, I'm saying that we are working on shorter time scales of the order 1 by n mu. So, so that, that's the time scale over which this model is valid. Okay, so let's uh, 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 see what, after studying this, what do we learn? So the first sort of obvious question is, what is the length of the adaptive walk? How many steps does it take before it hits a local fitness peak? So this is an old, well-known answer. The adaptive walks are short. 
So here I am plotting the average walk length as a function of sequence length and you see uh, it increases, but the uh, typical walk length is about 6, 7, 8 steps. Okay? And it depends weakly on the fitness distribution. It is not very different whether it is uniform, exponential or power distribution, it is sort of similar numbers. Okay. So, in fact, this is known uh, from the work of Gillespie and Orr that walk length increases logarithmically to sequence length. So, there are later works also which uh, these guys considered only the exponential distribution and later works have extended it to other distributions as well. Okay. So, I wanted to give an argument because especially since I have not seen this in biology, biology literature to understand why logarithmically. Okay. So, it is a simple calculation. I just wanted to take you through, uh, walk you through this. Let me forget for a second that I have uh, Kimura's or Haldane's transition probability. Let me take an even simpler model. So, let us say that all mutants are equally likely. So, I am not saying that the ones which have a higher fitness uh, advantage is more likely, but let us say all are equally likely. And for simplicity, let me consider uniform distribution. So, let us calculate the fitness th that uh, will get fixed in every step. Suppose the initial fitness is 0. What is the fitness at the next, time, next step? It is an average fitness. It lies between 0 and 1. It will be integral. It is just half, as you would intuitively also expect. Okay, this is just a normalization. You repeat the same thing, but this time your integration limit is from half to one, and you will get three quarters and so on. It's a very simple calculation, and I think it's sort of nice to be able to do this. So what this will tell you is that the fitness fixed is increasing towards the maximum exponentially fast. Okay, from minus two to minus six, but of course it will not, you know, keep happening. It will not go on forever. At some point the population is going to hit the local fitness peak. From extreme value theory, we know the height of that peak. It is 1 minus 1 by L and if you equate the two, you will immediately get log L. So, this characteristic that is logarithmic is very robust. Whether you take Kimura's formula, Haldane's formula, equal likelihood, whichever fitness distribution you take, this is one simple message that the walk length increases logarithmically and it is sort of robust to changes uh, to, you know, you can make your model more sophisticated, this much stays. Okay. Walk length, uh, so other thing is how do fitness correlations change the walk length? So, if the fitness landscape is correlated, what does it mean? Correlations means the fitness landscape is getting smoother. If it is smoother, that means there are less number of local peaks. If the number of local peaks is less, that means population can go farther. So, as you would expect, walk length increases as correlations also increase. Again, we could uh, do some calculations here, but let me not, um, I mean, I do not mean to describe it, but I just want to tell you that for correlated fitnesses also, it is possible to obtain some analytical solutions. You could do it for bounded distributions, but for unbounded distribution, we have not been able to do that. Okay. So, that is one quantity. Uh, so, the, the two points, walk lengths are short they change logarithmically and secondly, they have a weak dependence on the uh, fitness distribution. So, this was a story when you go from initial fitness to the local peak, but what happens in between? Fitness is increasing. So, let us characterize that. So, second quantity that I am considering is the fitness fixed at the chair step in the walk, which is defined more carefully now and here is the distribution that the fitness fixes f at the chair step starting from f naught, the initial fitness. And one can write down a recursion equation for it. So, in the last week, we have been writing certain recursion equations, but I would like to point out that those were difference equations. Here, I am writing an integral equation. Okay? They are generally, generally a little bit more complicated. Okay? So, let me just explain what it is. So, if I want to get a fitness f at a j plus 1 at step, it has to come from a lower fitness h at the previous step, provided better mutants are available and if that is so, a transition occurs and the you know walker gets there. So, it is simple to write down uh, and it is possible to analyze it under certain approximations. Okay, so, ha after having done that work, this is what we find. So, for exponential distribution, we can show that the fitness fix increases linearly with the step. So, that is this black line, but uh, it is done for a very, very long sequence, infinitely long sequence. So, therefore, you know, uh, as L, the sequence length increases, 
the agreement increases, agreement gets better. So anyway, the, it's not surprising or anything. Of course, fitness has to increase during the adaptation process. But, okay, so this was the answer for exponential distribution, and we can do the same thing for other distribution classes also, and this is the sort of approximate recursion relation that we get. The important thing here is this coefficient a. We can calculate it explicitly, but the important thing is that it's larger than 1 for unbounded distributions and less than 1 for bounded distributions. And why is it important? If you calculate the fitness gain when the walker goes from one step to next step, that fitness gain is proportional to a to the power j. Now, if a is less than 1, it's saying the fitness gains are decreasing. Whereas if a is larger than 1 for unbounded case, it's increasing. Okay, let me sort of uh, display that. So what I'm saying is, for unbounded, sorry, for bounded distributions, this is the fitness as a function of adaptive substitution. If you plot that in a stepwise manner, the step height is decreasing. That's the usual diminishing returns pattern. But for unbounded distributions, step height is increasing. Okay, so here is an example of accelerating return. Okay, same thing is sort of plotted. Uh, fitness difference function step. So, the uh, lines are our analytical solutions and the points are obtained from simulation. Okay? So, this is the sort of basic thing that I am saying that fitness evolution is very sensitive to which class you are in. You see accelerating return pattern or diminishing return pattern depending on the behavior of the tail of the fitness distribution. Okay? Now, because adaptive walks are short, you may not be able to go to six, seven steps and uh, it might be easier, let's say for an experiment, to measure the fitness at the first step alone. And if I measure the fitness difference at the first step as a function of initial fitness, again you see a similar pattern. Diminishing uh, the, the fitness difference decreases for bounded distributions, increases for the unbounded one, and for exponential sort of in between, so it's a somewhat constant. So this is what we think. I mean, I'm not sure how experiments are hard or I mean if it's doable. I think it should be possible. So, the, the point that I want to make is that if I were to do an adaptation experiment, so I am saying you measure the fitness fixed. Instead of plotting the fitness fixed, you plot the fitness difference and see uh, whether it increases or decreases. And that should tell you what is the kind of DBFT which is underlying that system. Okay, so that is the main message. Okay. So we so, so far, I considered only weak mutations. So, we did some simulations for strong mutations in which there is interference. Again, we see the same pattern. So, I think it is rather robust with respect to uh, the details of the adaptation dynamics. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, I wanted to give this argument because, so, it is still weird that how come it, there are accelerating returns. Typically, everybody hears about diminishing returns. Let me try this argument and see if you are convinced. So, transient probability or the fixation probability is proportional to let us say 2s or 1 minus e to the power minus 2s. It favors large selective effect. It is an increasing function of s. Right? For bounded case, large changes simply will not be possible after some substitutions. There will be some crowding to get some effect. You cannot go beyond this value. So, you make a high jump, but then you just do not have space for it and uh, you can expect diminishing returns pattern. But for unbounded distributions, there is all the place to go. So you can go here and it is available. You can go even farther and so on. Okay, so this is a very simple argument and I can make it a little bit more rigorous, but I think let me just try to skip it. Okay, maybe since I have time, let me just take you any way through it. It is um, okay. Yeah. So for bounded distributions, let me just do a two line calculation. So the calculation I am doing it is I am not invoking anything about the nature of the adaptation dynamics and see if this argument is robust. Okay, let's, so let us do it. So, if I have boundary distributions, the fitness at any step is below an upper bound, right? Therefore, the fitness difference is less than or equal to u minus f naught, you use upper bound. So, I am plotting f1 minus f naught as a function of f naught. So, this red thing is this red line. What can this fitness difference do? It cannot. So, this is the absolute boundary, the red line. What can this fitness difference do? It cannot remain constant because it will hit the red line. 
it can increase keep on increasing because it will hit the red line it might increase but then it has to decrease so that it remains below the red line okay so it follows that you will see diminishing returns pattern just because your distribution is bounded for unbounded distribution let me assume a linear relationship between the fitness as first step and the initial fitness i am assuming that but you can try this argument for other possibilities also but suppose i just assume it for a second and uh, selection coefficient is just a minus 1 plus d by f not for large f not is a minus 1 right this simple uh, one line calculation but for adaptation selection coefficient is positive that means a should be larger than 1 and it immediately follows therefore that the fitness difference should increase for unbounded distribution okay so for large enough initial fitness fitness difference increases okay so note that this argument i did not say what kind of fitness landscape i have whether there are correlations epistatic interactions strong mutation weak mutations so i mean i would be happy if you can sort of you know point out a flaw in this argument to see if it will break down so right now i think it's a robust argument and it simply depends on the nature of the state of the fitness distribution and really nothing very much more than that okay so now since i at least i believe in this argument i can ask what do experiments suggest and can it be tested i think it can be tested experimentally and here is an uh, experiment by mclean et al in which they plotted exactly the quantity that i'm referring to they are plotting the fitness difference at the first step and the starting fitness as a function of the initial fitness and they have just three points and they have fitted to a straight line although but it is a decreasing uh, it's decreasing one and our theory would suggest the dbfe in this case is a truncated or a bounded distribution so this is the adaptation dynamics but somebody has to do the experiment on this system by brute force method by actually measuring dbfe to so that you know we can compare whether the theory is really correct or not so that has not been done similarly this is perhaps not so convincing but this is the only one i could find this is from virchin chow in older paper in which for at least two populations you see the step height is increasing so this height and then it decreases later on okay so we would think our theory would suggest that the distribution here is a fat tailed one again nobody has actually measured dbfe directly for this experiment so we don't know whether or, or, or whether our claim is true or not the experiments which do measure dbfe haven't studied adaptation dynamics so that's where the story stands as as far as experiments are concerned so i just wanted to point out one more thing people generally measure selection coefficient but selection coefficients don't see don't show a qualitatively different patterns in the three domains they show sort of you know similar numbers are different but patterns are similar so uh, so they, this may not be a good quantity to measure if you want to know more about dbfe okay i think so okay let me just skip this and just summarize so we studied adaptation rugged fitness landscape that are characterized by these three extreme value domains so this is something i really think is important that dbfes are not just exponential there are other two types as well okay and uh, we believe that we have identified an experimentally accessible quantity which shows qualitative difference in the fitness domains and therefore it should be possible to measure this and learn something about the distribution but certainly we need more experiments to make the connection that i'll stop